following interview was conducted with Betsy Gordon for the Purdue University Libraries on August 29, 2017. The interviewer is Stephanie Schmitz. Also present is Lou Lieber. Welcome, Betsy. Thank you. Can you tell us when and where you were born and what life was like growing up? I was born December 24, 1948 in Newton, New Jersey. That's the northwestern corner of New Jersey. The town I lived in, I actually didn't live in the town. The town is Walpack Center and had about six houses in it. We lived out of town. Uh, it was a very small valley. You could see from one side of the valley to the other. My father uh, had a John Deere franchise. He came back after the war and went to Wall Street for a while, but didn't particularly care for it. So he married my mother shortly thereafter, and then they decided to move to the country where my father's family had uh, a country house. So my dad bought it, I guess, from my uh, grandparents. It was a farm. So it was a very rural, rural area. And he had a John Deere franchise at uh, 23 miles away in Newton. So I was the middle of three kids. I have an older brother and a younger sister. And it was kind of a delightful childhood in the fact that we were, it was the country. I mean, the country was, you know, the hills, the mountains, the streams, all sorts of fun things like that. Then I went to a, uh, a, a school, a small school there uh, in another town, which is about 15 miles away. And after that, I had a year of public high school, but it was kind of the tradition in the family to go away to boarding school. So I then went to the Baird School in Orange, New Jersey, and was a boarder there for two years. But it wasn't a very big boarding school, and my sister had gone to Moravian Seminary for girls, so I pestered my parents and wanted to go to that school because it was a lot bigger. Boarding school was more fun. Hmm. And after boarding school, I was not a really good student. I had trouble reading and uh, didn't really want to go to college, so I didn't fill out any applications or anything like that, but my friends in school filled out the applications. I got accepted at Winthrop College in Rock Hill, South Carolina, so I went there for a year. Uh, again, was not too excited, and I was from the north, and this was from the, in the south, and it wasn't, it wasn't really too exciting for me. But I met somebody there who was super smart, she was also kind of outcast because she was super smart, and I was from the north, so we were a great combo. She got offered a job in a lycée in France, and she said, well, do you want to go? I don't want to go alone. I said, sure, I'll go, and I called up my parents and asked them and um, basically went and lived in Europe for two, two and a half years and fell in love and uh, traveled around Europe and... That's kind of it in a nutshell. And then I, uh, when I fell out of love, I thought, okay, what, what? I didn't want to run home, so I basically went to, my friends got me a job in a ski resort up there. Mm -hmm. And I spoke no Norwegian at that time, maybe just a little tiny bit. So I wound up getting on a train with a piece of paper in my hand that said where I was going. And I got off the train went across the street, got on the bus, gave the piece of paper to the bus driver, and he, through all these different kind of motions or whatever, was going to tell me when to get off the bus. Wow. So we went on the bus up the hill, and people in traditional co costumes would get on and off the bus and this and that, and pretty soon nobody was on the bus except for myself and this other person. And it's snowing and whatever, and we got to a stop and the bus driver pointed and said now you get off and so it turns out the other person became my roommate at this ski lodge oh. and that's where I learned to speak Norwegian so but previously to that we'd lived in uh, my friend Dada and I had lived in France she was teaching there I went to the University of Strasbourg and studied France French you know and since we'd both fallen in love with Norwegians and we went to Norway and 
It's a little confusing of the history here. That's uh -huh. I'm repeating myself, but it was the adventures of being young and crazy wow. and in Europe. So did you learn to ski too? No, I was terrified of that. <laughs> I mean, I was big enough to be. It was a big enough situation, you know. Here I was in this foreign place, not speaking any language, and uh, how I learned was on the job. I mean, I was a waitress, and when I would didn't understand something, I'd go into the kitchen, and I'd go, s'more, s'more, and then the lady would point me to the butter, you know. That's what s'more was. Huh. Wow. So, and then after that, I came back to the States, and I didn't know what I was going to do. I, um, I worked as a hostess at a Holiday Inn, or not a Holiday Inn, a Howard Johnson's. Uh, a hostess at the hotel and we'd go pick people up at the airport and bring them in and then the other person that worked there after me would wear short shorts and be kind of uh, she had a side business going I think and then the, the guy who ran the place asked me to kind of wear those outfits and it just was not I was in my little dress and this and that and I decided I, I couldn't handle this. So I thought, well, what do I want to do? And I uh, actually worked with uh, special ed kids, and I loved it. Mm. I worked as a volunteer there I, because um, I had I have inherited wealth, so I would I had an allowance, you know, which enabled me to do uh, to work as a volunteer. Mm -hmm. I loved it. I loved because you had to be, you really had to come from your heart to, 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 to work with the kids. And they knew it, you know, they, they knew it. So after that, um, it's kind of a long time ago, all this stuff, so the details are hard to remember. Yeah, okay. I went to New York, and um, again, I worked as a volunteer in a school there, and I, it was great. It was just, it there was something that I, I didn't have a great vast education. The only education I had was me, you know. Mm -hmm. And uh, when I was in boarding school at home, what I did was I worked as a volunteer at a hospital, and I learned a lot from that, that uh, being a volunteer and the rewards of, of um, doing things for people was tremendous mm -hmm. and so working with the kids was the same thing mm -hmm. this sounds very confusing now that I'm kind of talking no, about my no, it seems pretty life. linear to me but right. it was it was all about um, it was something that I had within me that I could offer and I didn't you know I didn't have to have a vast amount of education to do it uh -huh. and I had some great coaches uh -huh. in you know in working in the school in New York certainly that was the situation. Wow. But how, did, how did you decide what school to work at? I had a friend who, uh, she was Jewish, and she was connected to a school. So the school that I worked in was, it was amazing, because I was the only non-Jewish person in the school. Mm -hmm. <laughs> Didn't really matter to me. And we worked with a lot, these kids were all different varieties, I mm -hmm. mean, of all different backgrounds and this mm -hmm. and that. And so basically my friend got me a job in this school. And then in both schools, the school in Pennsylvania and the school in New York, I worked for a year as a volunteer, and then they, then I, kind of proof myself at that time and then they hired me. Uh -huh. Of course it was totally minimum wage but didn't yeah. matter. And when so, you lived in New York, did you live in the city? Uh, I lived in Queens and then I moved to the city later on. Oh. But by that, when I moved to the city I was on to, I'd left the school, I think I'd been there for like three years or whatever, and left the school and took some courses at the new school and this and that. But I always felt like there was more. That I, I felt like I was Life had to, it wasn't giving me enough juice in a way. Mm -hmm. You know, I, I love the work that I did. And when I moved to Manhattan, I um, I did some schooling and uh, kept looking around. And then I can't remember, but I met a lady by the name of Barbara Findyson. And she was doing a kind of a bastardized version of the Fisher Hoffman. What's that? A Fisher Hoffman is a program that you basically take apart your childhood, the good things and the bad things, and uh -huh. you recognize the patterns that you've learned, and you realize that you're the one that's responsible for your life, not your parents, you can't blame them for this or that, but uh -huh. 
uh, and then I worked for them for about three years. They were not really, Barbara wasn't really organized, and I kind of saw that. I did the process a couple of times, and then I worked with them filming birth regressions and things mm -hmm. like that. And then um, during that time, um, there was a body worker there, and she had applied for the Groff training. Mm. And it was time for me to move on because I'd done as much as I was going to do there. Mm -hmm. She said, I'll come do this with me. Um, that was, I guess, in the late 80s. Yeah. What about the 60s? Before we jump to the 80s, I want to know what you were up to when the counterculture was happening, especially if you were in New York. No, I was living in Europe by that ah. time. So I, when Woodstock was happening, I mean, I'd heard about it, this and that, but I uh -huh. was I was on an adventure in Europe, you yeah. know, kind of traveling around and studying and being in love. So uh -huh. there was no way I was going to... You had other things going on. You know, uh, yes. And, and you didn't... Probably. So I wasn't really connected to that because I was in a boarding school, a girls' boarding school, uh -huh. and all that sort of stuff. Because uh, I graduated from high school in 1968. Mm -hmm. Okay. So and the uh, the boarding school was really pretty restricted, mm -hmm. which was fine. Mm -hmm. I mean, I am delighted not to have been active in that time because mm -hmm. I didn't have. Uh, it would not have been safe, set, and setting, and I would have been in trouble. Yeah, yeah. And I would have been, I didn't ha I wasn't grounded enough, I think, in myself, so it wouldn't really have, I'm happy as a clam that mm -hmm. I wasn't active at that time. And do you recall any murmurings around that time of good psychedelic research happening? So like oh, no, I wasn't at all connected to that yeah, at that time. Yeah, no w Walter Cronkite in the dorm? <laughs> no, no, I was not, I was not, uh, not there. Okay. Uh, yeah. So, but the, when I started with Stan, I mean, it was, I think it was a three-year program. We met twice a year for quite a long period of time, and uh, it really opened up the, the doors as to another space within me, which I think I'd kind of touched on with all the volunteer work that I'd done, that kind of heart space that mm -hmm. um, really is its the essence, it's the core, it's where you can come from. Uh, that's where I like to come from. That's where a lot of the work that I do now comes from. It's kind of like the the hit of the essence. The essence hit, I guess mm -hmm. you could call it. Or just finding true gratification and purpose. Too. Yeah. Uh, and I have to say that you know I was had been very fortunate and to have uh, to have had family funding, although I didn't comprehend it until way late mm. later on. You mm -hmm. know. Um, uh, but I, when I say I didn't comprehend it, it's like I, my wealth didn't come and land in my lap mm -hmm. until I was much older, and that was pretty great because I had had, by that time, some experience mm -hmm. with uh, life and grounding and other mm -hmm. opportunities. But it still didn't, the foundation work didn't come until much later on. Mm. So how did you meet Stan again? I was introduced by uh, one of the people at this, uh, it was called the Star Process, this Barbara Van Dyson had run. It was kind of a bastardized version of the Fisher Hoffman thing. Mm -hmm. And one of the people there had known about the training, and uh, and, this and I was ready to leave. Uh -huh. you know? So this was kind of like the next step. And what kind of training was it? It was the holotropic breath work. Okay. It was the residential holotropic breath work. And it was amazing because there were like two people. I was one of them that didn't have like vast qualifications. I was not a doctor. I wasn't a shrink. I wasn't, you know, I didn't, I had a couple of years of college and that was it. But the rest of the people in that thing were very highly trained as therapists and this and that. And God knows how I ever got in there, but mm -hmm. I got in there. And was this during the time when Stan was based mainly at Esalon? No, I think he'd, after, he'd been out of that. It was in the 80s. Uh -huh. so he was like 85, somewhere in there. So... And was, was he in New York? Was he based in New York? No, he no, he was in California. Okay, in Mill Valley. Okay, so you did you did your work at that um, 
place in New York, and then you kind of ventured off to California. Well, basically, what I was doing when I was working with Barbara Finn Dyson, I was commuting back and forth from oh. New York to California wow. to do these programs, and the programs were like 17 days and 21 days, so there were kind of large chunks of time huh. that you'd be there. So you're probably a certified holotropic breath Twice. practitioner. Twice. Oh, wow. So, uh, huh. And how that happened was uh, Stan did a month long in Dahlonega, Georgia, and it was like the last one he was going to do, and uh, I said, well, I'm going to do it. I mean, a month-long program with that. Mm -hmm. And then basically when I did the Graf work, he had a lot of trainings going around. Um, he would have programs in the United States, so I would fly and help facilitate at those mm -hmm. different things. And then... He also um, was doing stuff in Russia and in Czechoslovakia, so I wound up funding some of those programs, br actually bringing Russians to the United mm. States and Czechoslovakians to the United States to study with Stan and do breath work. So that's kind of where my active funding um, started mm -hmm. in this period. But during those trainings, I'm, you know, Stan's work came from psychedelics, and so the, obviously the study of psychedelics, the conversation of psychedelics came up and I thought to myself gosh I've always been in such control I really want to do something before I'm 40 okay and so I met a person in that uh, program that I felt comfortable with and so I started my psychedelic what would you say investigations uh -huh. Good during work. that time and uh because I felt so safe. I mean, we had ground rules, safe, set, and setting, by mm -hmm. gosh, you know. And that that created the framework by which I could do my internal work. Mm -hmm. And I could look at things that I didn't want to look at that perhaps affected me, which I knew affected me. Mm -hmm. uh, like, early on, I'd been molested as a child, and so that had a really great effect on my life. And... and I remember how I kind of started to look at that was a, I had had my first massage in California. Hmm. And when the masseuse hit my butt, all of a sudden this whole flashback Whoa. came. And so, you know, with my sitter and these materials, I was able to look at that and see some of the p patterns that I had carried through my life, that, mm -hmm. you know, that I had made to protect myself. And you can from that vulnerability again, so you can suppress it for such a yeah, and long you, it's kind of one of those things that kind of had an effect that I really wasn't aware of. Huh. So the the materials opened up the door to look at some of that and to see what I was carrying that's kind of stopped me. So eventually, you migrated to California. Yeah, I migrated. Well, my sister um, had. Uh, by that time been married and she'd had a couple of kids and this and that and she when I was living in Manhattan I used to go visit her and the kids and this and that and she decided to move and then I thought you know when she left uh, I thought I, you know I was ready to move and so I moved to California she had moved to Arizona huh. gave it a shot for a year and moved back by that time, I was not going to move back from California. Uh -huh. And California was really great because um, it was a place, it's interesting, it's quite different, I believe, or I feel in California than, say, the East Coast. It's much more open to things like this, mm -hmm. or at least the community I was involved with was. Uh -huh. So, And there was a community there. Oh, yeah, there were all these breath workers. I mean, it was all these breath workers and by that time I really had started to use psychedelics myself and uh, not by myself but with a sitter mm -hmm. as tools for tools to therapy. see what was inside to mm -hmm. see what you know how can I how, how can I feel better about my life and what I'm doing and uh -huh. you know and the other side was also I had this wealth that I had inherited and it was kind of it's uh, 
you know, I supported a lot of different things like breath work and, you know, bringing the Russians in and bringing in the Czechoslovakians in and, you know, going over there and doing training programs mm -hmm. and this and that. So that kind of started the seed work of all these different uh, programs mm -hmm. to these different things and, yeah. So you continue, okay. We'll Break. Start. Okay, we'll pause for a sec. All right, so we're back. So you studied holotropic breath work, and then did you become a regular practitioner of it? Well, I helped people because I'd much rather be a background person than a lead person on mm -hmm. that, uh, and that was the part that I enjoyed. Hmm. You know, it was like when I worked with the STAR process, I was more of a background person because they were extremely disorganized, uh -huh. and I was very good at organization, so I did that. But uh, no, I rather liked to go and be on a team uh -huh. That's much more exciting to me. And so you just did that periodically. I did it pretty much in the early, a lot during the early, uh, well, it would be probably the 90s the and this 90s. and that. And also, gosh, we, one of our training programs is actually in Findhorn, and that's how we got connected to bringing the Russians into Findhorn because it was closer than the United States. And eventually they came to Dahlonega, Georgia. We brought them really? over from Dahlonega, Georgia. Yeah. Where is Findhorn? Uh, uh, it's Scotland. Wow. So, so, but the other, we were talking briefly about the people that were in that training, and one of them is John Mack, and the other one is Rick Doblin. And John Mack was in Group B with me, and Rick Doblin was in Group A, the bad boys in Group A, uh -huh. right? How many people in a group? You know, I think, oh boy, now that I think about it, maybe it's 20 some odd. Uh huh. But, uh, and all of them. It was phenomenal work to be with this group of period for that length of time, twice a year, and doing intensive work. A month at a time. Well, no, they were two-week periods, I think, one or two weeks, I can't remember, but we met twice a year. Okay. So, But after this period of three years, you really got to know people. Mm -hmm. And Stan was an incredible teacher. I mean, we'd wind up staying up till 2 o'clock in the morning talking about people's processes and this and that. But he really created a wonderful framework for working with psychedelics. Mm -hmm. And that's how holotropic breathwork got in discovered invented, created, whatever you want to call it, it was because uh, psychedelics were then, you know, illegal. Mm -hmm. And part of the thing that was interesting in that, I remember seeing one of the, a film from Johns Hopkins about a, a fellow uh, that was a terminal cancer, it was, and he was tripped and, you know, had tripped with LSD, and Stan, I guess, was the sitter or whatever. But the the part that was really stuck in my mind was the before, how he was before, and how he was after. So it was kind of like the first exposure to, wow, what a difference this stuff can make, you know, given the right set and setting and the right person. Mm -hmm. So, um, and then, you know, during this period of time, there were lots of conferences happening, the ITA and this and that. And so I met a lot of, you know, Charlie Grobe and different people like that, Ralph Mester and... People and I, I was trying to think how I got connected to Hefter, and it, I'm sure it was in that early phase. I mean, the kind of the interest in this, um, these materials, and and the potential and the differences that, that given the right conditions can make, I thought was really important. I looked at what a difference it made in my life. I mean, it enabled me. I feel a lot of the work that I've done with foundations, with my foundation, really was helped and stimulated and grew from my use with psychedelics. Mm. I want to backtrack a little bit back to the, the breathwork training. Yeah. So where did that take place? Well, it was all over. We did some in Hollyhock. We, our last one was actually in Findhorn. We did a lot in Pocket Ranch in, in uh, Northern California. So it, it varied different places, but it was always the same group and the same team uh -huh. and this and that. Over an and extended uh, period yeah, of time. Like years? Three, I think it was, it was either two or three years. You'd have to ask Stan because it was quite a long time ago. But it was a wonderful, it was a fabulous program. Mm -hmm. 
I mean, I think because of the intensity, and you get to figure that everybody in there was doing their own personal work mm -hmm. supported by this group. And we worked in teams of two, you know, so there'd be whatever, 30 people. You'd have 15 people breathing and 15 people sitting and going through whatever. And Stan was there overseeing the whole thing, you know, and explaining it, going into the birth matrixes, and this is what happened, and da-da-da-da-da, and, you know. So it was really a very intensive training thing. And it was, you know, I had no desire to go out and really practice it afterwards. That mm -hmm. wasn't, I went to learn, I uh -huh. think, only for myself. Uh -huh. Whereas other people did a lot of practicing. And I helped uh, uh, two people in Atlanta. I used to go down and fly down and help them. You know. uh -huh. And was this Stan's first cohort of breath work? practitioners or does he just did he kind of start in the 80s and just have classes it was the there was one other training program and it was in Europe and uh, two at that time and then afterwards I do believe it broke up you didn't have Stan you had it changed mm -hmm. and developed and whatever and, and uh, but we had Stan the whole time it was great mm. and during this time period your life must have been changing pretty drastically to go so spiritually deep. So I would imagine that you were, or maybe beforehand, you were already dappling in other spiritual endeavors. It's funny, I don't relate it to as, um, I guess you could call it spiritual, but I think I, I don't, um, I don't know, I don't know that I, I don't know what I'd call it. I was looking within, I was looking for strength from within. Uh -huh. I was looking for, uh, where's that essence? Do you know when you see a little kid and how they respond? Oh, I'm excited, or how natural their response. I was looking for that mm -hmm. part of me that had gotten lost. Mm -hmm. You know, that kind of coming from that heart, from not being clouded over with all this other garbage one mm -hmm. picks up in life. But did you gravitate towards things like yoga or? Um, you mentioned I gravitated right towards psychedelics. Really? Yep. Shortly after the breath work. Uh, yeah, after I was forty. Let's put it that oh, way. That's, that's right. when I was that's forty. Right. And, and, and I thought I'm gonna. You know, I really want to look within. I want to. I want to know more about mm -hmm. me. And that's interesting because psychedel. So, what year did you turn forty? Okay, so I'm sixty-eight now. Uh huh. So let's see. How is that? No. 1988. Oh, so 88, yeah, okay, so that was the beginning of my psychedelic career. And I feel like in those mid to late 80s was a really quiet time for psychedelics. Like, that was the age of big, Well, don't right? forget I was underground. I was doing all this underground because yeah. it was... But even even in, in the realm of pop culture, I feel like the late 80s are known for their lavish, you know lavishnessness like that was the norm for the time so to be in this community I could see it being characterized as sort of a pretty niche area I'm sure it was the person I worked with also um, had a background with the secret chief Leo Zeff and huh. Lee and sh that person had been trained with Leo Zeff to work with psychedelics previously to working with Stan and Breathwork. Uh -huh. The two of them are really on the same path. Mm -hmm. You know, about educating people. Well, I don't know that Stan was so much educating people for psychedelics. He, I don't think he was into promoting that. That was just his background. Because mm -hmm. basically there's an underground and an upper ground. Mm -hmm. There's in the trenches mm -hmm. and then up here. Mm -hmm. I'm just I'm just interested in whether or not you discovered breath work because your personality always leaned in that direction or you're just open minded and and the timing was right. Well, I think the timing was right, and I was looking for something more. I was looking for where am I in this world? What is my purpose? What's the life? That sort of mm -hmm. stuff. Uh, you know, what What am I going to do with my life to give mm -hmm. it value? Mm -hmm. Or am I going to do, like, 
or just kind of float on. Yeah, and I thought to myself, I really don't want to float on. Mm-hmm. I, you know, it's got. I'm, where where is my value? And I think it came from. This sounds very weird, but I really had a hell of a time reading. I was not a good student. Mm-hmm. If you were a student, you could get college educated and go get a job and this and that. Mm-hmm. Plus, I had this inherited wealth, so it was kind of a. It's not always the greatest thing to have this inherited wealth. I mean. Uh-huh. I, and luckily enough, it wasn't like handed to me on a platter. I lived like with an allowance and this and that, and uh-huh. I didn't do extreme things. I yeah. mean, I didn't. I was on a pretty tight budget, uh-huh. and then I, I put myself always on one too, and you know. Huh. So you continue. You continued with the breathwork training, and you tried psychedelics, and was a, a eureka moment. It was kind of like I want to go further with this. Oh, okay. I want to know more. Could I ask what substance you started with? LSD. Oh, wow. So you just went right for it, huh? And I can say, you know, it doesn't mean all these things were... There were were some hard times in there, some really hard times. But I knew I was safe. Uh Uh-huh. And I didn't have to worry. You know, I knew I was with the right person, and I didn't have to worry. I knew that they would keep me safe and help me get through some of those things. Uh Uh-huh. You know. Had a lot to do with breathing too, ah. yeah, because people get afraid; they hold their breath. Uh-huh. So, you know, so yeah. it's like, okay, let's look at this and take it apart and whatever. Did you go in with feelings of hesitation, like about the quality of the substance? Or? Every time I went in, I was scared. Are you kidding me? Okay, <laughs> that's interesting. But it's, to, know. to backtrack a little. When I was working with special ed in New York and this and that, what I did um, in the summertime, first I did, um, I tripped, and we called it tripping, but it was canoe tripping. It was, I canoed with wooden canoe to Hudson's Bay, to James Bay. Uh They were like, I was challenging myself physically and mentally because when you do things like that, you have to drop a lot of your baggage because you're so physically exhausted. I mean, I biked in China, you know, I trekked in in Peru and this and that. So I was challenging myself in another way, you know, through a Mm -hmm. physical way Mm -hmm. to get to a place where I felt better. Uh Uh-huh. You know, doing huh. that sort of stuff. So, and we called it tripping too at oh, that time. Canoe so tripping. So, I did that for about eight years in the summertime. Canoe trips. In yeah, New York. Oh, in Canada. So that's interesting. That really gives some insight into. So it's kind of I was searching for something all this period of time, you know, uh-huh. and. Uh, and I would imagine canoeing and being in nature, and especially in in upstate New York, was just. Absolutely beautiful. Well, no, this was in Ontario. This is in Canada. Oh, this is in Canada. Oh, and, you know, Hudson's Bay, huh. James Bay. Okay. Carrying wanigans, carrying canoes, you know that sort of stuff. How that was long tough. You, how long did you do that for? I did that trip? for eight years, but I the two long trips were to that was just two years, and then the other ones I did short trips, and I actually worked for the camp as a cook. Oddly ah, enough. Fun. <laughs> wow. Hmm. So you, you you did the the breath work training, and that sounds like where you really started to build up your community of. Well, you um, met a lot of people that were on the same path. They were looking. I think you know it was an exciting community. You uh-huh. know, it still is an exciting community. When I see somebody that I've done that tra- training with, I mean, it's like whoa. Yeah, and that's what. That's how you became so close. With oh yeah, I mean, I, there's lots of people now. I go up to Burning Man, and who do I meet? But you know, one of the guys from it, Sheila Bohm, he was in the training, pro, you know, program. So people are doing some good stuff. Kylie Taylor and huh. Jim Schofield and stuff. They're out there doing some good work. Diane Haug, I mean, Brigida Ashour Groff now. Uh-huh. I mean, they were some of the early early breath workers and they're out there doing good stuff uh-huh. and um and you mentioned rick doblin was in your cohort he was it yeah we were he, you know standard uh first the group a and then group b they were back to back uh-huh you know was so. he was he talking about how back then was he talking about making psychedelics um I'm sure he was out there. I'm sure he was. <laughs> he was already yeah. He's always headed in that yeah. direction. And that was his 
Yeah. Uh-huh. Huh. And, you know, uh, yeah. And John Mack, who is he? John Mack is a really cool guy, actually. And he, um, during our training program, John Mack, who was at Harvard, uh, met, well, a lady by the name of Blanche Shavesty was in the training program, and she was talking about UFOs and this and that, and somehow they, that's where John Mack got started on UFOs. And I remember we had um, a psychic whose name was, I'm trying to think of her, she was, Ann Armstrong came, and one of, I'll never forget, John had already started with UFOs and whatever, and, and Ann Armstrong had come, and she, uh, we could ask her anything we want, and somebody had asked her, I think it was John maybe, asked her, what about UFOs? You know, because there's sort of UFOs, before, there was kind of like <coughs> UFOs. And she'll never forget, she said, these are friendly beings, hmm. which at that time, to me, it's just like, okay, my relationship to thinking about UFOs and this and that changed, because okay, these are friendly beings, so that's how I sort of think of that, mm, if I were to think about it now, you know. Not everything is necessarily an It doesn't energy. have to be, yeah. Huh. I mean, there were marvelous things that came out of that. I mean, a really enrichment out of those training programs. I mean, all the stuff with the Russians, and we went to Russia with Stan and Christina. He had given his class the opportunity to do that, and there was myself from our group and another lady in the other group, but she dropped out. Mm. So I went to Russia, and then, mm. uh, yeah, it was just some really cool stuff. Gosh, I, I'm, he I'm hesitate to ask because it might be fixating on the minutia too much, but I, I kind of also wonder how hanging around this group of people in such an intensive environment just informed your lifestyle and your way of living. Well, it certainly impl it certainly influenced me to move to California. Uh huh. I'm totally. Yeah. I moved for that. I mm -hmm. used to commute from New York to mm -hmm. California mm -hmm. to do mm -hmm. LSD. Uh huh. That's quite. I a mean, trip. it's like, and I knew nobody over there, in, in the, and I'm sure there were people around, but nobody over there that did that. Or you know. that's a good point because I bet there were people around the East Coast who were up to it. Maybe, but you know, everything was so underground. Mm -hmm. And New York just had that different. Well, energy. it's a different vibe. Mm -hmm. It's a whole different vibe. Hmm. And so, what part of California did you end up settling? San Rafael. Okay. Yeah. And so you transplanted there and continued to build this community of like-minded. Yeah, I met people friends. here and there and this and that, and I and I, I was trying to think how I got involved with Hefter, but it was pretty early on. I I really don't know the the dates, but I'd met their guy that was a. Um, and I'm trying to think of his name now, really a neat guy, but he was the fellow that they had for a development officer or person. And his name, he actually was an environment lawyer, and yeah, he still is. is and I, at, and a for, I can't for the life of me remember his name now. I bet if we look at Dave's filing aid, we can find him. Is it there? Do you want to pause this thing to get his name? Sure, we can look up his name. Hold on. So you just moved to San Rafael. What year was that? It was probably about 25 years ago, 24, 25 years ago. So something. that was well into the 90s. Yeah. Then. Yeah. Okay. And then... Um, and this is after having lived in New York for a while. Oh, yeah. I lived in New York for about 18 years. Wow. So... And, and commuting to do... Then, yeah, I was about nine years in uh, Forest Hills Gardens and then in Manhattan. And when I lived in Manhattan, I... That was when I commuted back and forth. Okay. I can't, the time thing is a little bit screwy yeah, in my mind. But right. uh, How did you choose San Rafael? Because the person that, I, that sat with me lived in San Rafael, oh. and it was such a big move because it, it's so different than the East Coast. Uh -huh. I thought, I really want to be around somebody I know. Yeah, yeah. That makes sense. And then I... Um, <laughs> okay, one second. Here we are. And um, okay, so, so you moved to San Rafael because of your interest in psychedelics. And actually, uh, the person that 
sat with me lived actually in San Rafael, and so that was that was somebody I knew. Uh, and that, that that person must have been a good and dear friend. Dear friend is my best friend. Uh, worked with Leo for a long, long time, and Leo, Leo turned Zeph. Leo Zeff, and Leo turned his his work over to two people, and this person was one of them. Oh, wow. So when I and then you know all those times there were all the conferences that Stan put on, and uh, yeah, but when, after I moved to San Rafael, I became involved in uh, w- workshops in the underground. Should I say? Uh huh. Um. Well, it's interesting that they're called workshops. So this must be a very concerted, intentional, very specific treatment. Very of specific stuff. I mean, we had uh, uh, well, we had study groups. We had a women's studies group that met. We had for several years, and where we, this group of women, would study the materials for, you know, a year or so and have mm-hmm. become familiar with them, and then actually the women would lead our group in a material, and that would be the, with the uh, with music. And we always worked with headphones and eye shades because it's an internal, that work, all the tripping I did was with headphones and eye shades. Mm. So all this stuff is internal. You're inside. You're not distracted by all this on the outside, which is very much how the research is done now. If you look at like Mithoffers and this and that, same pattern, uh, Johns Hopkins, all that, headphones, eye shades, sitters, ground rules. Mm-hmm. I mean, and it was marvelous, marvelous work. And the people, all those people are dear, dear friends. And, you know, we've been in the trenches together Mm -hmm. you don't it's when I see some of these people you know the love that I have for these people that have supported me and I've supported them in the process uh, you know of of kind of looking within it's been phenomenal Mm -hmm. and then uh, can you talk about that group of women that you made alliances with what would you like to know about them? They were all, the backgrounds are all far out. Moms, this and that, you how know, well, how doctors. Did you, how did you make friends with them? And did you ever talk about, well, well what's interesting is like, well, why did women band together? Well, women are, are wonderful together. Women support each other. You know, women go to the well. That's, you know, you get nurtured. If, if you got a problem, where do you go? You know, you go to your girlfriends. Mm-hmm. Where's, so that's that. And along the way, I met all sorts of wonderful people, you know, like Francis Vaughn and Angerian. And just through the living in California and being in this kind of group, you meet all the transpersonal mm-hmm. people and... Oh my gosh, all you know, the Shoguns, Jim Fetterman, Ralph Metzger, all these people were in the transpersonal field. Well, what is Michael that? Harner, you know, who does the same sort of work but with uh, drumming. What is the connection between transpersonal psychology and psychedelics? What is the link between those two? They seem I don't know, you're asking me, so <laughs> what I would say is it's like the heart. It's, mm-hmm. a, it's an essence connection. It's a heart connection. If you want to get technical, go ask somebody mm-hmm. who's got letters after yeah, their name. Yeah. You know, but, uh, yeah, it's it's that connection. It's like you, you know, and there's a wonderful opening there. There's a wonderful, I, I don't know how to explain it, but I think it's where you can do... Uh, I don't know. I just feel like that kind of space benefits a number. Well, it's really it, 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 the first time that allows you the out of body experience and to deal with non material, which then opens your minds to all the possibilities that she did not know existed before. Mm-hmm. Which I was looking for in a way. I was psychedelics was the perfect. Mm-hmm. It's the same thing that happened to a lot of the shamans hmm. that use psychedelic drugs. Okay. It was an immediate opening to the non material world. I mean, what was really exciting or what, you know, as the years go, have uh, gone by or whatever, I've been given a tremendous opportunity by having inherited wealth. And so that's how my interest in this field came about. And as I met people in the transpersonal field and they were doing work that I thought was going the same sort of, I want to say open heartness, you know, essence, whatever... I wanted to support them because I thought their work makes a huge difference. Mm-hmm. It was very interesting. I, as I, 
was trying to think how I got involved with Hefter, and I forgot the fellow that I met, but he was a development director there, really neat guy, and I remember he came over, and we just hit it off like that, and because Hefter was doing, they're doing research with psychedelics, they're doing legal stuff, they're doing above board work, mm -hmm. you know, I thought, how can I support them? Well, this fellow and I hit it off, and I thought, Jamie somebody. Yes, Jay, um, you're getting there, Lou. <laughs> We're getting close. <laughs> well, think of it before the interview. We hope so. But, but basically, so I started having fundraisers at my house. Ah. And that's how it happened. Uh, the fundraisers started, and it attracted all these people in the, that, that, the transpersonal realm. And Hefter needed funding because they couldn't... Right, but you know, I'll tell you, it was quite funny because when we first started to do that, I started to do funding with Hefter. I funded... Uh, you know, as I had funded Breathwork, I James did... James Thornton. James Thornton, yeah. Huh. He was a great guy, really great guy. So we kind of dig up how we were going to do different, you know, these different fundraisers and things. Huh. So, uh, but initially when we started, we said, oh, well, let's have a fundraiser. Well, lo and behold, you know, got the caterer, got the people, sent out the invitations, this and that. But we didn't know enough to ask for money. Oh, yeah. So we'd have these great gatherings, and so it was like these community. I'm thinking, oh, well, how come they're not giving us any money? Well, we never asked for any money. Mm -hmm. So then I uh, had met a guy through uh, IONS, actually, and they deal with consciousness always, mm -hmm. also. Not always, but also. At that time, they were dealing with that kind of consciousness, um, which I do want to talk about the Gathering of the Elders. Yeah. After, through IONS, I, I had the opportunity to fund the Gathering of the Elders uh -huh. at, at Festers, which was Albert Hoffman, all these people in this realm. It was so exciting. Yeah. But, uh, but, to the, but raising money for Hefter. Well, I mean, what was funny is we, I hired somebody to teach us how to ask for money mm -hmm. because we weren't asking. This took a few times to well, do it. But how did the Hefter crew know to ask you to ask for money? <laughs> they didn't. It was James and I kind of came up with, we'll do a fundraiser because they need support. James uh, the developer. Thornton. Yeah, James yeah. Thornton. And okay. then... Um, Early on, Charlie was doing his studies, and then uh, Charlie, Grobe. Charlie Grobe, and then through, um, uh, it'll come to me, um, Bob Jesse uh -huh. had introduced uh, me to, uh, through Francis Vaughn, I guess John, Bob Jesse got connected anyway. He introduced me to the stuff that Roland was doing, and so we did early funding with Roland. Roland and Charlie and all that when there was nobody around. Yeah, I'm kind of curious what it was like for you to meet like Charlie Grobe and um, Bob Jesse before any of this was really taking. Like, it's not like this is trendy at the time, um, but these people have gone to, to be pretty well known in the field. But when you first crossed, crossed their path or when they first crossed your path. Do you remember those interactions? In your Not really. In, in your initial impressions, did, they, did anything stand out about, ah, oh, I think these people Well, really I don't know. Something. I think the thing was, you know, it's like, oh, I was, a, I was a funder and these guys were doing their work and I think they were appreciated that early funding. Mm -hmm. And did you realize, like, that this psychedelic Reemergence was happening when it was happening. Did you know that this is the beginning of there's something catching here? I didn't. The, I didn't. Wasn't thinking in that manner. I just felt like this is really important. Uh huh. This is important stuff, and I believed in it. I didn't think about much more than they needed funding, and I was able to do it. Huh. So. Uh, and but and it had given me marvelous opportunity. I met fabulous people. I bet you know, especially like at the Fetzer thing. That was really far out. There was Albert Hoffman and Houston Smith and all the heavy hitters in this thing. And the Fetzer thing is the ga gathering. The of gathering the of the elders, elders, which was what in the ninety-eight or something like that. But it was a wonderful so, experience. It was really. Did, whose idea was that? I think that either came from Fetzer's Wink. or Ions or Wink what? Franklin. Wink Franklin. Who was that? Person? Wink Franklin was actually the head of Ions there, and Wink Franklin was the last person. See, Ions was attracted to me. That's how I got connected through Ions. I actually let me backtrack a bit. I actually got connected 
from the underground work that I did, I get connected to the person that was responsible, Elise Agar, for developing the program at Fetzer. Okay. And so they needed funding, so I, said, I, I, I was happy to have that opportunity. And so I said, well, if I'm going, you know, really, the person that I work with should be there too because they have far more experience mm-hmm. and far, much more open so that we went together and we were, uh, I was a funder and there were not many outside people there. Rick Dobbin was there though. Hmm. I mean, when you look at Stan, when you look at this field and you look at Stan's people, a lot of Stan's people were early on, you know, like Rick Doblin, this other person that was in the training with me, that was a sitter, Uh and myself, says a lot. This is these are Stan's people that have kind of um, moved forward this field. I feel interesting, you know, from my perspective that is, but that's uh, Hmm. whatever. But yeah, so Stan was almost a catalyst. I think so. For propelling things in this direction. Oh yeah. And I don't know that he intentionally did that because he'd already created breath work. He didn't have to do anything else. Uh And that was a way to get to an altered state legally. Uh Uh-huh. Yeah. Just that a lot of us went to the (laughs) underground. Yeah. And I wonder when Dave Nichols comes on the scene, you know, he was a chemist here. And maybe we can ask him in his interview, but how he happened on the scene. Do you remember your first interaction with him? Uh, not really. I can't, you know, I, yeah, I don't, you know, I don't remember how all those things developed. Yeah. It seems like it was a long time ago. Yeah, and a lot of people, there, a lot, there seems to be just a lot of people involved in this. Well, it's quite exciting, you know, it's, it's, it's really exciting. But I think uh, Hefter doesn't have enough women. I'm the yeah. only woman in that yeah. thing. And as a funder of this, did you talk about the role of women in this area of research as you shelled out a lot of support for this research? Did you ever notice that? Hmm. Oh, yeah, yeah, yeah. I, oh, I definitely noticed there were not some women there. But you have to realize when you got together with the Hefter guys, they're all Beano's. They're all, you know, they're all scientists. They're all mm-hmm. up here. Mm-hmm. So, you know, it was like I, the thing I knew how to do was the groundwork. Uh-huh. Those guys could be in the skies talking about chemicals and this and that and whatever. I wouldn't understand it, but yeah. I knew what they were doing was something important. Yeah. What about um, other therapists like Betty Eisner and Francis Vaughn? Did, did you ever talk about the women's role in this movement amongst yourself? Not really. Not really. Hmm. I mean, I have since then. Yeah. yeah. Since yeah. then, I have. Yeah. yeah. But, Hindsight uh, is twenty twenty. You know, but here I was, you know, you've got to figure that that I came at it from a different angle. I didn't come at at it from an intellectual angle. I came at it more from a gut angle. Uh Uh-huh. And a supportive angle, too, as opposed to a critical. But that's the part that I could see that I could do. Now, if I hadn't had the funding that I had, it might have been a different channel. It might have been a different show, but I had the funding Uh so that... And this is a field that clearly needed funding. Yeah, so I found the niche where I could be. I also found that I could hold these things at my house, that I knew I could do that. Support the work that, that was yeah. so meaningful. And so to this still day, I have stuff at, in my house uh-huh. because I feel the community is important. I think it's important to stay connected. What about this gathering of the elders? Um, com- was it a conference? It was a weekend, I believe. It was kind of like all those people that are interested in this, yeah. And and so, who whose idea was that? Uh, Winks. Okay, Winks. Yeah, Yeah. Winks. But that's how I got involved with um, Noetics. I thought these guys are dealing with consciousness. If they're dealing with consciousness, I want to be involved, and that's where I met Lou. Yeah, the 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 whole idea is is that at Fetzer is where it was held at. Wink was on the board also at Fetzer. Uh-huh. And the idea was is that people were always linking the, the, between this between science and spirituality. Uh-huh. And what happened with the whole psychedelic movement was it was kind of skirting a little bit through spirituality and into science, but back into spirituality. Huh. So almost every one of these researchers became really super spiritual, per se, like a Ram Dass, mm-hmm. certainly Houston Smith. 
uh, the fellow from Tucson, the famous guy with the beard. Um, <laughs> no, he's, he's, he was at Harvard at the same time there with Ralph, and he was, uh, oh, he's written all kinds of books, but, uh, and he's now, I think, still at the University of Arizona. Uh, but he's, you'd recognize his name. Uh huh. So you had all these guys, and then the whole idea was is that Fetcher was trying to sit there and say, how do we go about changing the world to become more, really, the, somewhere the blend between science and spirit? Mm -hmm. So this met Fetcher's goal. It also met Ion's goal, looking for how to explore and get people into a greater consciousness because the founder of, of Ion's, or the first president of Ion's, had always written the idea that we need a global consciousness change, mind change. Uh -huh. So all this was all kind of feeding, everybody was kind of talking around it. Eslin was talking around this, where Stan was a, was a big deal there at Eslin. Uh -huh. So Wink's idea was if you bring all these folks together, what this allows us to do is really try to explore, are we exploring all the things necessary to get to that next step of greater consciousness? Hmm. Wow. So it was consciousness oriented with the idea that the psychedelics were brought in because there was a lot of very well-educated people they use psychedelics as their, in effect, their entrance into the spiritual world, mm -hmm. spiritual realm, some more than others. And I did, didn't realize that's where you two met. Oh, yeah. Well, I met then her because I went to then, Wink had asked me to come and help out IONS in their treasury type function, some of those things, mm -hmm. as a volunteer. So I did that, and then they asked me to be on the board. And at the board, we would meet with the circle donors. And Betsy was a circle donor. And we kept on, basically, we'd share lunches together and different things there. And finally she said, well, maybe you could help me. And I said, Pro I probably can't. And that's that's when we started that's a relationship, in probably 2003, I think. It was a while ago, yeah. Huh. Because I went on the board in 2002. Yeah, and I can't remember when. It doesn't. But it's interesting, because you can, th I, I can see, I, looking at my own life or whatever, this also relates to my relationship, I think, to, to the Tibetans, mm -hmm. uh, because I, I, I see the, the connection between essence and heart and compassion, mm -hmm. and that's the that's the the message that I get. You know, people say I've done a lot with the Tibetans. You know, funding and this and that, but. Um, People say, well, are you a Buddhist? I go, ah, you know, I'm not really, da 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 da, da. But the, the, it's the essence. It's the essence. Mm. It's the compassion towards the next person. It's the gratitude. And I think that that really, what is essence? I mean, essence is really about a compassion for yourself and about a compassion for the other person. And if you can see that, can you imagine what a difference that would make? I can't imagine. So, I mean, it, it all is really related. It has a lot to do with why I wound up funding this thing. I thought, you know, here are these guys. They're doing serious work out there, science work. People love science because mm -hmm. if they can prove science, then that validates the other thing. Mm -hmm. I didn't need to have the scientific proof. I had the experiential mm -hmm. proof. Mm -hmm. You know, so if you're going to go public, you're going to have the science stuff. So mm -hmm. that's... And then Dave was here at Purdue. He's the lead guy, LSD guy, and this and that. And so that's why I wound up at Purdue. And that's the whole, I thought, you know, that that really needed to, to happen. To, to, we, we, you got all these guys studying this. It needs to be in one place so that the next wave coming through doesn't have to repeat what the last guy did and start at square one. It's like, okay, come here, look at this stuff, this, and, 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 you know, go back, look and see what these guys have done so you don't have to repeat it. And so you're talking about archival material. Well, it's like archival. It's everything that you you know you you have here. Uh huh. Um, so. And I think it's it's important to have that. The the tactile the history. It's mm -hmm. important to have the history mm -hmm. somewhere. You got to have the history. Mm -hmm. And how did that come up? That conversation about historical documents and. Well, we had it. Lou and I had the uh, the conversation initially, and then it was Lou's idea to put it here because of Dave. Well, we talked about here or at Berkeley. Okay. Yeah, and with Berkeley being a, almost a natural fit there in the Bay Area. Yeah. But then we had this close tie to Dave. Uh huh. And Betsy had this desire to sit there and say, you know, Stan really has never found a home for his stuff. Yeah. So then we said, okay, we'll make if we get this going, we'll have Stan be in effect the program officer of it. 
Uh huh. And he then brought in a, in the advisory group uh -huh. to work with Dave, with Big Dave, because obviously the work that Dave had done here all those years, we said, what what a better couldn't be a better place. You have an institution that's going to be around for a long time. Mm -hmm. Again, the, the whole idea was making sure there's one place available so people would not repeat the mistakes in mm -hmm. the past. And if you got all these experimenters from the chemistry side, you got all the clinician and their work. I'm just curious who who had the the foresight to think of archival sources because I feel like these fields of study, chemistry, I I don't. Feel that there's a lot of chemists who look back. Can't stop. There's, a, there's a science is always looking forward. Yeah, yeah but science. look at this. What they're looking at here. What what are you looking at? I mean, if you were going to develop an asthma or something, why would you bother to go back? But you're developing people, mm -hmm. people's essence, people's compassion by this kind of. I you know when you look at the PTSD stuff and the MDMA. Certainly, look what you're doing. You're connecting that person again to that, that innocent child. Mm -hmm. That part that was unpolluted, shall we say. Mm -hmm. So. Well, the other thing, though, to answer your question of why Purdue in, in different areas is that we saw the examples of a lot of the private individuals and institutions that wanted to do this, mm -hmm. that they never could get traction. Ah, Interesting. Okay, that so wanted to. There were people that buy own collections, you know, just like when Timothy Leary's collection came. Uh huh. Out. Didn't do anything. And I just said a day that doesn't really do anything for us because even though he's a very renowned person, mm -hmm. he didn't write a single deal from the chemistry side yeah. that changed the world, nor did he write it really from the clinician side. Uh huh. So we said, no, we need to find the people that really do the real chemistry work and have that to access to future students. Uh huh. So that the, you, can refer back to studies that have already been done. Uh -huh. And certainly on the clinical side, you have all the studies that were done, whether it was Spring Grove, all these different places, uh -huh. to sit there and say, this work's been done. Uh -huh. So, But there was no central location that seemed like it was doing this. So we said, well, let's start one. Uh -huh. It's interesting because Dave has an appreciation for history too, it seems, which is, un I don't know, maybe I'm generalizing, but I feel like that's sort of out of character for scientists. Like I said, I think I think people that saw enough of the failures that they realized, how is this going to happen? Yeah. And so when Betsy said, yeah, well, let's do this and I'll fund it, well, for scientists, that's that, that's all they had to hear. You're going to fund it? Oh, okay, yeah, I'm all for it. Uh -huh. <laughs> so that's kind of really what then triggered it. Huh. But like I said, I think, especially with Stan, with him going through two fires, having so much of his data destroyed, and you're sitting there saying, well, how does this work go forward? Because the whole worry was is that, you know, by 66, he had all this great work that was just set to halt. Mm -hmm. And they're going, well, my gosh, there's there's all kinds of potential here, which the underground, underground movement kept it all going forward. Mm -hmm. So you have enough people, not you don't have to be 80 years old to appreciate what psychedelics do. Mm -hmm. Because there's people at all ages now that have continued to sit there and say, well, let's, let's work with this stuff. It works. And the material aspects of these historical resources, like experience reports from people having a session, mm -hmm. that's such... Well, that's where you see Arrowwood's got a lot. Mm -hmm. Qualitative data that I feel like wouldn't be captured. Like the well, and that's even if you look in, in from the Foundation for Shamanic Studies, they're the first ones to capture people's journeys, they call them journeys, to mm. get from our world for the first time and actually write them down. Ah. Most journeys were almost always oral histories. They were all, people told the stories, hmm. but never wrote them down. So then they said, well, let's start capturing. They captured thousands of these. And that's what's part of the archives that are not going to be at Berkeley. Uh-huh. So. I mean, so it's exciting. It's really exciting that, you know, this is a resource. Uh huh. This and that the research really has taken off. Oh yeah. Well, now you have actually research projects that go on at Burning Man. There's totally, Burning it's a read. The, the book Burning I Man recommend. Burning Man is a live experimental site. It's, a, it's, it's a, <laughs> you know, Burning Man is is really a live place where people go and talk about what work is done, what what chemicals that they've used, or whatever. And now researchers are actually doing research at Burning Man. Like anthropologists? Well, I know Ions had one there Ions for a short one. Yeah. There's just a psychological experiment. Yeah. I think they were recording. There's a lot of yeah. stuff, but there's a lot of creativity that's going on there, and it's coming from this field. And I mean, yeah. it's like our world is going so fast and so big, and, you know, we, I, I just feel this tremendous. Well, there's many people from Silicon Valley that attribute their <laughs> abilities it. 
to the fact that they were they did psychedelics. And mm -hmm. stealing fire. Whether by the whether way. it's Steve oh, whether it's okay. whether it's Steve, Steve Jobs, I mean his uh -huh. autobiography, or you look at the fellow we had, the the guy that did the software, and he'd sit there and say, under acid, he could see a billion lines of code. Oh, it was amazing. Uh, Ashana. Remember Ashana? Ashana? Yeah, he was very wealthy. Oh, my God. His, I mean, so it wasn't, wasn't making this stuff up. He actually did it. Uh-huh. And you go, okay. Yeah. But a couple of the funders on that side, on that, over there, that's, well, yeah. The Microsoft guy. Yeah, yeah, yeah. So, yeah he was the one who he had done it. He was one of the original founders. And he had, he died, and when. But he's one of Hefner's biggest. He funders. was one of the biggest things, and he died. I came on the board, and he died shortly mm -hmm. thereafter. Who was this? And his name, another one of those uh, people, and I always. The original forget. Microsoft Seven, Seven, one of the original. And uh, him, well, what basically he was funding, and then he's I came on the board, and yeah. really nice guy, but he died shortly thereafter, so uh. they didn't have a funder. Now Hefner now has a couple more funders, uh -huh. so it's very nice. Uh -huh. But. Um, and I always forget it too. It's like I have no idea why I forget certain things. But anyway, it's so interesting. It's so psychedelics seem so widely embraced by people, for example, in Silicon Valley. But it it also is just seems like the exact opposite direction in which our world is moving. Yeah, totally. Is Isn't it? But if you look at the amount of people underground, for example, take pot. I mean, how many people in this country have smoked or are having or are smoking pot? I mean, it's a vast amount of people. Uh-huh. Or or how many people smoked it when they were hippies and maybe not doing it now, yeah. but there's been a lot of people that have experienced yeah. Doesn't necessarily always mean it was great. I mean, mm -hmm. you hear a lot about these things that have gone wrong and people have flashed back and this and that. Well, they don't have the basic ground rules yeah. now. Set and setting. Uh huh. You know, yeah. and know your material. You uh -huh. know, have a sitter. I mean, uh, you know, that sort of thing. Yeah. Huh. Um, I mean, it's a really incredible field. It is. It has such potential. It's so exciting. Do you, do you have guy, Bob Wallace was a fan yep. of psychedelic drugs and founded a software company after Microsoft. Huh. Okay, this is if you all you got to Google is, is the Google it's called the Microsoft employees, the first eleven employees. Huh. Of course, this was the kid. Uh huh. That's what Gates looked like when he found it. Oh. <laughs> um. And they got a picture of him. So it is interesting. Um, and Bob Wallace, and when you came on, he had just died or what died shortly He died thereafter. shortly thereafter, because I remember I was so excited. I thought, oh, wow, here's another funder here, and it's like, okay, he can kind of teach me the ropes yeah, or whatever, yeah. but it, he died shortly thereafter. Mm -hmm. What did he die of? Do you know? Uh, uh, it could have been a mixed research and psychedelics after leaving. He also founded a software company called Quicksoft. He died in 2002 from pneumonia. Well, there was talk about maybe it wasn't always pneumonia, mm -hmm. so who knows. Mm -hmm. But, you know, um, it is interesting um, the people in the tech industry who have experienced these substances and it having the profound effects. Oh, yeah, and that would be wonderful to be able to get connected with some of those people. Yeah. Yeah. That, uh, if and they're comfortable, you know, coming out about it. I'm yeah, but it's, how would we? How can we make that connection? Mm -hmm. you know, it's like because I, I think that would be important. Mm -hmm. You know, to really have a repository where all this uh, experience and stuff is recorded and people can or scholars looking at the person yeah. holistically and maybe focusing on yeah. how that one part of their life may have been significant. Significantly impacted. I mean, did you know Bob Wallace lived in San Rafael? Yep. Were you neighbors? Over the hill. He was over <laughs> the hill from my <laughs> yeah, yeah, yeah. So you mentioned being um, compelled by Tibetan. Well, I don't, somehow it um, spoke to you. Yeah, well, yeah. I mean, it just. Uh, I, I, Tibet, I, I, it's, it's tough to kind of. Into yeah, because I, I think it's all essence work. <laughs> mm -hmm. But it's uh, something that that you found very compelling. Oh, I you know, um, 
I'm drawn to it. Let's put it that way. I'm drawn to it. I really believe, you know, the Dalai Lama talks a lot about compassion. Think about compassion. Think about what a difference it would make. When I'm around my Tibetan friends, the gentleness and the whatever and the all really, the, all, the, the kind of the lovingness that they hold. And I have to say, it's almost all Tibetans that I've met. Hmm. I haven't met one who doesn't have that a gentle... Um, a gentleness and uh, openness, I would say, mm -hmm. open to the inner self. Mm -hmm. I don't know how to describe it. Do you fund projects relating to Tibet? To, to oh, yeah. Tibet? Oh, yeah. Can you tell us about some of those? Um, Right now, I have a scholarship program that's gone on for, what, 10 years now for the Tibetans here in the United States. Mm -hmm. But I also funded the, the Shugsep Nunnery in Dharamsala, and that's for the Shugsep nuns, and we purchased the land. And, uh, well, interestingly enough, I went to Tibet with Stan. Uh -huh. And the person I work with and a group of other people through... Uh, uh, group called Cross-Cultural Journeys, and at that time I think it was connected to ions, again, consciousness and whatever. So after having traveled with, uh, having gone to Tibet with Stan and my friends and this and that and whatever. Um, what was Stan I, up to in Tibet? He was supposed to be lecturing during that time, and it's really quite funny. I remember him leaning over the back of a bus seat trying to lecture us as we're going across oh, this oh, desert. Oh, it was oh, really oh. funny, but Stan and Christina at that time, yeah. And it were all, they were all breath workers that were on this trip, huh. and it was maybe, maybe 15 or 16 people, something like that. Huh. But then after that, I became really interested in the Tibetans, uh -huh. and uh, I was visiting my friend in Hawaii, and I'm not a computer person, but at that time... Since I was visiting, I didn't have anything to do at home to take care of, and this and that. I sat down and started looking at stuff, and I found the Shugsep Nunnery. And there, there were pictures of um, this building with, you know, six and eight people in one room, and the this walls would be... But the, the walls were covered with fabric because they were all wet and, and dripping, and this uh -huh. and that. It was a really funky-looking place, but that's where these ladies had had to live and so at that time they were looking for funding for the land and I thought well I can do this because it wasn't that outrageous I mean it was reachable uh -huh. and so I contacted Lou and we did it and then we uh, visited Dharamsala and saw the saw actually the place where these ladies lived and they were looking more f for more funding to do that and I thought well I can do this can you talk about what the nunnery is well, you'd have to look up the Shugsep uh, thing. It's a big building uh -huh. that houses 108 people. How do you spell it? S-H-U-G-S-E-P. And okay. it's in Dharamsala. Okay. Yeah. And, uh, but what's really exciting about it is the Shugsep nunnery now has young girls that have come across the mountains without their parents, and they have them housed there, and they're training them or teaching them and this and that. It doesn't mean these kids are all going to be nuns, uh -huh. but it gives them the the care that they need and the opportunities that they need, so it's really cool mm -hmm. that they have uh, all these nuns, uh, you know, the nuns and the kids and this and that. And and after we funded that, I came home and wrote letters and collected like $70,000 for the furnishings for that nunnery. Wow. You wrote letters to your friends. I wrote, oh yeah, I mailed out a lot of fun mailed out tons of letters and and we got the place furnished oh, wow. you know so it was kind of cool so I'm uh -huh. very excited to go back for this now we have the celebration of the nun the nuns now can debate they're on the same level with the monks this is huge and how did that come about who kind of got that ball rolling Rinch and Kando who Rinch and Kando the Dalai Lama's okay. uh, sister-in-law okay all right yeah and this is a huge this is big this is big time yeah and are you going to be part of that ceremony? Well, they invited me. They called even. Oh. She said, you're going to get an invitation for this. Can you come? And then, I, yeah. So oh, it's cool. very exciting. Take lots of pictures and donate them to the archive. <laughs> <laughs> Actually, I'll send you the ar the books that I have that we had done from previous, you know, because we would go over there. We've had a previous thing over there. Yeah, where, uh, we did it for the dedication. Yeah. And you've got your own Tibetan outfits to wear. Yes, that's why I have to lose 10 pounds. <laughs> oh, gosh. Don't we all? Yeah. <laughs> yeah. Um, 
And then are there any other funding projects that you're involved in that you want to talk about? Well, CIIS, yeah, we've done that. Oh. California Institute of Integral Studies and their program for trainers, uh -huh. for sitters, actually, because the phase three, they're um, Hefter and are getting ready for the phase three trials, and they need, phase three is a lot bigger, so they need people, trained people, to be able to sit with these, they need sitters, basically, mm -hmm. is mm -hmm. what it is. Mm -hmm. Sitters, and so the people that are coming to CIIS are look, from all different backgrounds, you know, midwives, therapists, mm -hmm. this and that, and whatever, they're interested in this field and would be uh, sitters. Okay, so wow, I didn't realize that the CIIS training program was potentially, I thought it was for, okay, if psychedelics become legalized, then at least we'll have some therapists to administer it. But right, but this is, these are, would be specifically for this, but we don't know when the FDA is going to get approval, but at least when it's approved, they will have a bank of people that they could potentially draw from that have had experience nice. of sitting. So those people will have uh, breath work, they will have all the back, they'll have Dave has come, you know, Tony Bossy's from New York has come, and you know, people in the field have come to do this education and you know, basic background of, of, of how sitting is done and, you know, everything that's needed. Plus, the people that apply to this are all really lettered people. Mm -hmm. You know, hmm. they're not just like regular people. Yeah. They're people that have been already trained in their fields and, you know. And there's probably a vetting process to get into it. Oh, yeah, that to get program. into it, yeah. And, um, where are we on time? You have three minutes. Okay. <laughs> well, is there anything I haven't asked that you want to talk about? I don't think so. <laughs> I, I, I don't know what else I can it's tell you. But it's been a wonderful process, and I felt really op I feel really a conduit for the inherent wealth that I have. Gosh. That this in it's interesting, but I do really feel that it's and um, yeah. It's so it, it's so exciting to witness. The change of oh, it's it's thrilling, and it's got psychedelics it's like, in the world due to people like you. Well, it's interesting because it's like it, the door is kind of open, and there's so many more people. So it's kind of almost for me, it's like too much. It's like huh. I know the people I know. That's it. That's enough. That doesn't mm -hmm. go as far as whatever. But it's now so, you know, Does so that much give bigger. Do you pause for the future, or do you have any hesitations about the direction in which? psychedelic research is going. No. I, you know, it, it's going to do... Is there any satisfaction in, in knowing that you were probably right and it just took all these years for other folks to come around? I don't think of it as that way. I really don't. I, You know, it's just like I was given an opportunity both by being exposed to this work and by having it here. I was just given an opportunity. I'm just one of the one of the people on the road. Gosh. And when you get pushback, you must encounter people who raise an eyebrow. Um, whether just in everyday interactions. I mean, I don't know how this stuff comes just up. Just judge from your family. Yeah. Well, I don't talk about this with my family. My family has no idea the uh, how I have donated and spent my funding. And interestingly enough, I did ask my brother, I said, do you want to know what I, <laughs> I do? And he said no. And I said, okay. So there's this whole legacy that you've created for yourself that not a lot of people know about. Well, what's really kind of exciting is it's like it continues the, you know, this energy that I got from my family. It continues into this realm, hmm. which I think is pretty great. What do you mean? Well, I think of money as energy. So um, I got a lot of energy. Oh. And so I got to give it away. I said, oh. you just like get to share this energy. So that's why I think it's like been a tremendous opportunity. Huh. That's all, you know, and it's like it's great because I have Lou, who really is smart in that part of it, uh -huh. who helps me do what I want to do. And I couldn't so that, do it so without. just spending on the material world. Yeah. She spends it where it's going to have a life well beyond her own. Yeah. Which is really kind of cool because then that's like, that's kind of my, it's like from my ancestry. Uh -huh. It's not me. I'm just the vehicle. Hmm. So if you saw, if, say your brother saw something on the news um, in regards to psychedelic research and maybe it's the holidays or whatever, and he says, do you see that news segment about how they're using psychedelics? What'd you say? 
I funded that. Would you? <laughs> I would <laughs> love it if he like saw my <laughs> name on a couple of these things. Did you ever send him any of the videos? Yeah, but I don't know that he's ever watched what any of them. You know, Brandon has. Brand, my nephew is uh, the one, which really exciting to me, is that my nephew is the one that he's interested in this field. He's aware of this field. He, you know, he's on the internet stuff looking mm -hmm. at it. I am thrilled. Mm -hmm. I am thrilled that there's somebody in my family, you know. I have another cousin that knows that I do this sort of stuff, and she's really cool about it. But I have a whole lot of my family that are not, yeah. you know. And it's okay by me. Ah, uh, that's a good outlook to have. You know, um, I must say most of them are Republicans. I'm a Democrat. <laughs> uh huh. Uh huh. And then uh, people on the the street. I'm trying to think of what interactions have I had where I've been a little bit too um, evangelical about psychedelic research, which is so easy to do because I personally find it so compelling. Have you ever encountered that sort of? Situation? I mean, sometimes I've been really excited about stuff and you know tried to share it, but then always you know it's not their <laughs> cup of tea, which is okay. But most of the time I don't talk about it. But most people I hang out with are all psychedelic, but um, you don't talk about it. It's like it's like you're all vegetarians, you're all whatever. That comes in handy, you know. Uh, and, and I'm thrilled to be in California because it's much more. It's easier going out there. It's much more accepted. The communities out there is pretty much. It's strong, mm -hmm. I'd say. And supportive. And That's supportive, and it's not like off the wall, you yeah. know. Some people, I think, they have that old history about, ooh, psychedelics, ooh, drugs, you know. Mm -hmm. Some horrible disaster's going to happen, and I don't happen to feel that way. Mm -hmm. Okay. So. Lou, did I forget to ask Betsy about anything in this interview? The only other thing I would just bring up is maybe that initial meeting, like the Dean referred to there earlier, about when we when we chose Purdue, what were some of your initial thoughts that you what you wanted to accomplish here? Remember we had our first meeting here? Yeah, I'm trying to think about that. I, I really can't remember so much on that one. Um, no, I was just excited that it had a home, to tell you the truth. That, okay, now it, the game program started. I think I was a little bit... I would have liked it to have picked up speed a bit more and had more interest in it in a little bit quicker than it has or to have more people be aware of it mm -hmm. or be as excited about it as I am, mm -hmm. <laughs> you know. Well, I think, for example, just the, on having Hefner put out the, all the publicity and all the, on all the study, current studies that are out there, there is a, a much higher recognition of the potential of psychoactives than there were when we started. Yeah. The idea that Purdue would actually host this as an archive was the first kind of breakthrough. Mm -hmm. Because it, it takes away some of the stigma that I think that, again, a lot of what we're fighting is kind of made up things. We're Past history, thinking. people's misconceptions, I think. Mm -hmm. I mean, I think the whole deal around this thing is education, really. And that's what I have acquired. You know, certainly with Leo Zeff, who I didn't know, but the person who I worked with was like second generation Leo, mm -hmm. and I kind of consider myself a third generation ah. Leo. You know, but uh, that recognition of that, you know. Well, um, and, uh, the other thing was is that we saw a lot of the generations that had done a lot of this work passing, mm -hmm. and there was nowhere really where their work was going. Mm -hmm. Even yeah. when you looked at. Uh, the old guy from Ions, that when he was at Stanford Research Institute, yeah. um, and you sit there and say, where was really his work going? He done all. He was the West Coast version of what Harvard was doing. Uh -huh. He was doing Stanford. It's the program that then Francis volunteered to be a subject. You mean uh, Jim Batterman? Yeah, but who did Jim work for? Um, oh, I'm always losing uh -uh. his name. I know I see his face. Yeah, uh, and he wrote the. And I can't tell you his name. Man or whatever. Is it Myron Storer? Mm -hmm. He brought the secret chief. That was a. I'm sorry we couldn't get his stuff, Myron's. Oh, me too. First <coughs> the W, didn't it? Uh, Willis. Willis Harmon. Ah. Okay, we've got a lot of his books in the Purdue right now. Uh huh. He wrote the different images of man. He wrote uh, a lot of the people in Ions that got attracted to Ions were because of Willis Harmon reaching out to businessmen. Ah, 
So George Zimmer got involved with Lions because of Willis, because he brought it into the real world. And he was talking about the idea that we needed this global consciousness change. He's also the one that, that administered the LSD for John Fetzer. So, you know, he, 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 and that was amazing that a man of his nature would be taking that stuff in his 70s mm -hmm. uh, for the first time. Hmm. Never too late. <laughs> no, but like I said, Willis led, led the research there at Stanford until in 66 when they got the letter to shut it down. Huh. So he was doing the exact same thing that the, the Leary and the guys were doing at Harvard. So it was, it, it was a, a, all a lot of the major you know, institutions in the United States that were looking at the pros and cons of LSD. Well, thank you for taking time to sit down and share your thoughts. Thank you, Stephanie. And thank you for your fine work. And, well, thank you for your support of the collection, too, and for Lou for keeping us in love. Yes, <laughs> thank you. Forget <laughs> Lou is the one that's... I'm the, I'm the interviewer. It's okay. You're, You're next. family. <laughs> no, 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 I don't do interviews. Uh,